Well, when they asked me to do a presentation on residential billing, I had to give it a little bit of thought as to exactly what they wanted to talk about. And so I kind of took my own um, idea and kind of put this together. So I hope I'm on topic and it's of interest to you. Um, what I wanted to do a little bit was talk about the residential billing. They asked me what's in a residential bill. And then um, I thought, well, you know, we really need to kind of dig down a little deeper into that and kind of explain, well, how do those charges show up on the residential bill? And why is your base rate $6.50 and this person's over here, his base rate is $10. So we're kind of take a look at it from that perspective. And then I thought, well, maybe take a look at um, kind of what's coming down the pike as far as consumers and the different type of rates that are being developed and what they're doing kind of in the electrical industry to recoup their costs as their kilowatt hour sales kind of take a nosedive through conservation and those type of things. So we'll kind of start out with that. Any questions before I get going? Okay. Um, and then I, I guess I kind of just explained this first slide here, um, the questions that they had asked me to kind of respond to so I can get into that. Not a lot of room up here, but um, the, uh, what are these charges on the residential bill? Well, this is part of my bill here that I get from public utilities, and it kind of explains, can you see, whoops, I didn't show up there. There. Um, part of the bill that I get from public utilities, and I hope you can read it, it's a little bit small. Um, but the first part that you'll look at is this monthly service charge. Basic monthly service charges are made up of the meter reading, the collecting, the billing and the collecting, customer service, meter um, operation and maintenance and replacement type things, and then a component of the distribution system. The other part that you'll see on your residential bill is the energy charge. And basically the energy charge are all the facilities and equipment that it takes to run an op a electric utility operation the distribution system costs, and then the big component is purchase power. Um, in Grand Rapids Public Utilities, we're a distribution utility only, so we buy all of our electricity wholesale from Minnesota Power and then retail that electricity. We get a bill that looks similar to a commercial bill from Minnesota Power. It has a customer charge, it has a kilowatt hour charge, which is the energy component. It has a demand component or kilowatt charge on it. Um, there's a fuel adjustment charge, and fuel adjustments are basically, there's a set component that they use in fuel adjustment, and then because fuel is kind of goes up and down throughout the year, they charge you the base component, and then they also modify that every month on the wholesale power bill. So if fuel goes up, they charge you for the difference. If it goes down, you get a credit on your bill. Um, and then there are also transmission charges on the bill, and those are pretty much regulated through the um, Mid-Continent Independent System Operators, by the Mid-Continent Independent System Operators. They take care of all the transmission congestion, transmission line goes down, they reroute the electricity and that type of thing so that you don't see any interruptions in your, in your electric service. They also do all of the uh, generator dispatching and marketing for all of the generation. And this mid-continent system goes all the way down to Louisiana. It includes 15 states and then goes up into Ontario, into Canada. And they're the ones that manage the transmission and generation for you. The next component on your bill I just talked a little bit about, and that's that purchase power adjustment, fuel adjustment clause, or whatever you want to, want to call it. In addition, um, some utilities, Grand Rapids Public Utilities, for example, also uses some of the variable MISO costs. I think there, Julie, you can correct me, there are like eight MISO charges on a wholesale power bill. Some of them vary quite a bit throughout a year. And um, we've set that up so that those variable costs get charged directly to the consumer. There's not a markup or anything on them. But it's a way of not having to guess what those are going to be when you're setting rates and you can get those pretty accurate to the customer so that it reflects the cost of service. Well, how do we, how do we determine the utility, not me anymore because I'm out of the business, determine what your energy costs actually are? Well, we do, there's two components that we kind of look at. The first part is a cost of service component. 
And the objective of that is to assign the cost to classes of customers in such a manner that they're non-discriminatory and they meet the cost of providing service to the customer. And what we're trying to do is each customer has a different need for electricity. A commercial building, obviously, we have to make a bigger investment to serve them than we have to make for a residential customer. And what we're trying to do in this cost of service is allocate those costs accordingly and then collect those costs from the customers as accurately as we can. Rate making is an art and a science. It's, it's both. So, um, when you look at cost of service studies, um, the first thing that we do is what they call the revenue requirements. So we look at the utility and we try to determine the amount of revenue that's going to be needed to operate the utility through a certain period of time. Um, we used to be able to have longer periods of time, now it's almost a year to year type thing that we are adjusting rates. So the revenue requirement comes from the purchase power in the case of a distribution only utility. It'll also include generation and transmission if they're a vertically integrated utility and they handle all the generation, transmission, and distribution costs. The O&M, capital improvements, appreciation, and any taxes or pilot payments that the utility makes, and then any other type of costs. Um, in our case, in Grand Rapids, we had some other costs related to um, service territory acquisitions, and those have to be built into the rates um, so that they can be collected and we can make payments. Then what happens is there's a classification of those costs so that you classify all your demand costs, your kilowatt hour costs, your um, uh, customer facilities charges, and then your uh, customer service charges, and then revenue related charges. Um, you put those kind of together, and this is for the whole utility now. And then the next thing that you do is you want to allocate those costs out to the customer classes that you have, residential, commercial, commercial demand, industrial, dual fuel, all of those type of things. So the next, the next step that you go through are the allocation of those costs. And um, you, know, you have a customer class because they, you, they have similar use characteristics. Most residential customers consume electricity in the same way today. Um, it's changing, and we'll get into that in a little bit here. Um, so once that's done, then you have, you basically are looking at a table that has residential, here's what the cost of service is, and then you go back and you pick up your electric rates and you figure out what's the differential in these two. And what you're trying to do is not figure out at this point whether you need a rate increase or a rate decrease, but you're trying to figure out is are the rates fair? Are you collecting from that customer what that customer is costing you to operate your utility system? Okay, so once you get that done, and if you're within 5% differential, then you're doing pretty good. They usually don't come out right match one to one, but if you're within 5%, you're doing a pretty good job of allocating your costs correctly and collecting those costs from your customers. Then the next thing that you do is actually the rate design. Once you have these kind of um, allocated to the different classes, and you know that each of the components, here's the demand for the residential, here's the energy for the residential, here's the customer service for the residential class, then you start going back and you start using your billing information. How many kilowatt hours did you sell? What were the demands for certain classes of customers? And you go back on a per unit basis and start building your rate structure. Now, residential rates today take the demand component and the energy component, kilowatts and kilowatt hours, and those are just combined. And again, they're combined because most residential customers will use their energy pretty much the same way. Um, in a business, they start to take and separate the demand and the kilowatt hours out, and they'll take a business and they'll actually build them on the demand component um, over a certain amount. So they, they, their bill will look like kilowatt hour energy charge, a demand charge, a fuel adjustment charge, taxes, and that type of thing. So it's a little bit different. So that's kind of the Reader's Digest version of rate design. I went through it really quickly. Um, 
current trends in rate design, I kind of looked at it from the standpoint today, you can kind of see we charge on how much you use. Um, your monthly service charge is based on what it costs. Your energy charge is how much do you use. Kilowatt charge is well, how much demand did you put on the system. And then your fuel adjustment charge. Kind of looking into the future, um, you know, what's, I shouldn't be flipping this forward. I'm sorry, I don't do PowerPoints. So excuse me if I, you know, I'm sitting here talking and rattling this off and I forgot to flip the slides forward. Um, so the current trends <coughs> in rate design are based on how much you use um, and what, what can influence the future trends in rate design. Well, um, future trends kind of are looking and the future is kind of here for the most part. For some years now we've been practicing some of these in the utility industry. Load management. Um, what happens in the generation facilities, you probably all know. They're, what they're trying to do is keep those generators running at a steady state. So what load management is trying to do is kind of even out the peaks and the valleys on the use of electricity. And uh, many of the utilities now, not all of them, are offering things such as water heater control. And what they're doing is they're taking, basically shutting your water heater off when the system starts to peak so that the usage goes down and they try to maintain that load factor across the board. Um, the same theory applies to off-peak heating, dual fuel heating, storage heating, that type of thing. They're trying to switch, trying to tell, send a signal that, you know, to bring these things off and keep that load factor even. Time of use with the changes in technology now, you have time of use metering. And basically what that is, is they want you to use that energy off peak so that they want you to do your clothes washing at night, your dish washing at night, um, those type of things that use energy or water heating at night. And what they'll do is that the kilowatt hours used in that block of time, they will give you a reduced rate. Because again, they're trying to shift that energy component over to level all that use and they don't have to ramp, ramp up and ramp down those generators <coughs> continually. Um, and then standby rates, I think in Grand Rapids we had uh, these businesses that have standby generation. We give them a special rate if they help us reduce our peak demand. The, the courthouse, the city hall, and the fire hall had backup generation. So on a real hot summer day, we would call them and say, can you bring your generators online? They would bring that peak down at that time. And then what we would do as a utility is we would give them credit for their demand charges because they helped reduce that demand charge, which saves everybody money in the city um, because it's lowering the cost per kilowatt hour charge over the monthly period. Okay, in the future, some of the trends um, to look at the question, how? Well, everybody knows Conservation Improvement Program in Minnesota. Utilities are required to spend one and a half percent of their revenues to reduce their kilowatt hour consumption by one and a half percent. Grand Rapids Public Utilities does a very good job of it. Um, they usually beat the one and a half percent reduction in kilowatt hours, and they have done it by not spending the one and a half percent, which apparently is a no-no at the state level because they kind of chew us out and ask us, well, you know, we thought it was a badge of honor that we could reduce our kilowatt hours by one and a half percent, by over one and a half percent, without spending the one and a half percent revenues, but they said, no, you need to spend the one and a half percent and reduce it even more. So the targets were kind of not what we thought they were, but Grand Rapids has done a really good job about that. Um, the other thing, you know, energy efficient products, you know, everybody's aware of those. There's rebate programs to get people to buy into those and to use those products to help reduce the energy consumption. Um, there are other things that some utilities are looking at. I know the water utility does it. They started using an inverted rate rather than a declining block rate. Typically, when you buy energy, the rate blocks, if there are rate blocks, go down in price. So the more you buy, the cheaper it gets. Um, they're starting to look at inverting those and they have, it's a state mandate to do it in the water industry that as you buy more, you pay more. 
Um, so that the whole thing there again is to you know aimed at conservation, getting heat to use less. The other thing that happens is um, net metering. Most of you might be familiar with that. You have solar or wind applications. You use a bi-directional meter. Your solar panels generate so much electricity. It runs the meter backwards. The sun goes down or your solar panel conks out for some reason your meter. You depend on the utility then to provide you electricity. What the state requires the utilities to do is to credit those customers back. If they have a credit at the end of the month, say they generated more than they used, the state requires the utilities to give back to that customer the average kilowatt hour cost based on that utility's residential rates, less the base or meter charge um, cost on that rate. The issue that came up with that is, um, are these people paying for their fair share of the distribution system? And the legislature addressed that by saying, well, okay, yep, we understand, you know, they might not be paying their fair share, but if you do a rate study, and you can show that the rates, credits that you're giving back to the solar customers and how they're paying their bills, that they're not paying for the distribution system, and you can come up with a methodology that we like, will allow you to charge those uh, customers that have solar panels to recover your distribution system costs. The cooperatives um, came out, tried to do it right away, and they were kind of turned down by the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission at that time. And I don't know, maybe Julie knows if somebody's been successful at getting those, getting that uh, rate credit through. Uh, it's been a pretty difficult um, challenge to do that. Um, the next thing, um, again, based on technology, some utilities are looking at residential demand metering. And the reason that they're doing that again is to send a price signal to customers with the technology that you have in the meters. I know Grand Rapids Public Utilities has the ability now to know what demand each residential customer is putting on the system so that they can now tell and they can now charge more accurately those customers that are creating that demand versus those customers that have a better load factor. It gets to be a lot of busy work and a lot of calculations, but that ability to do that is out there. Um, the other thing, you know, and it's it's all kind of a drive toward this load smoothing um, type of thing, and that's that's what they're trying to do with that. Now, what's the utility doing on the other side? Well, the utilities aren't dumb. They're sitting out there and going, hey, our kilowatt hour charges are going out the window. This conservation thing is really killing our revenue stream. Mm -hmm. So let's increase our base rate and recover all of our costs through the fixed component of that bill. I think um, Lake Country Power just did that, well, I shouldn't say just did it, a number of years ago, increased their base rate, I think, to $42. It might be up to $48. What they're basically doing is as their kilowatt hour sales decrease, they still need to pay for all of this capital investment that they made out there. So they're turning it into a fixed rate, charging it. So they don't care that the, util that the kilowatt hour charges are going down. They're still going to get their money by that, fixed, by that fixed rate. The other thing that's out there is what they call decoupling. And, and basically what decoupling is, or the utilities are, are saying, okay, we don't care what those sales are to any extent. We have this investment sitting over here that we made. As long as we can get a return on that investment that we're happy with, um, we'll not look at the sales side of this thing. So the, what they're doing is they're decoupling those two. They're not looking at their sales anymore. They're looking at this rate of return, and that's what you need to earn your money on. <coughs> so some utilities are doing that. Um, we just started that, and uh, again, it's because there's a decrease in that kilowatt hour sales that you know they depended on for the money. So, um, kind of moving on, the other thing that I think this is getting into opinion now at this point, um, future trends is unbundling your electric bill even further so that people can see what's in that electric bill. Um, Conservation Improvement Program, everybody gets charged the percent and a half 
there's no reason why that can't show up on your bill so you know what's in that bill. Um, things like pilot payment, franchise payments, and other payments that are mandatory required by government entities, I think those should come out of the energy and demand component of your bill and be on the bill so that you know what those charges are. Um, and then unfunded government mandates. Um, if the government comes out and says, and this is local government, comes out and says, well, we want these power lines underground, even though that overhead system is um, in good condition, it's doing its job, but for some reason they need it moved or they want it underground, um, those are kind of an unfunded mandate that the utility has to pay that you have to pay for. And if they would come up with a methodology where they could put those as a line item on the bill, and then as that thing gets paid off, that line item goes away. Otherwise, what happens is it gets built into the bill and it really never goes away. Um, you know, it's kind of in there and that sets the base for that, for that electric um, rate. So that's just kind of, like I said, that's kind of getting to be, um, that's more my opinion than uh, what's happening in the industry anyway. There, there is, just one more comment on that, Minnesota Power actually does that with capital improvements that they have. If, they, if you're on a Minnesota Power, if you're a Minnesota Power customer, you'll get a bill, there are maybe five or six different categories on that bill. And if there's a requirement by the state to do something with their effluent, they rebuild number four generator or something like that, they're actually, instead of going through this whole rate um, structure, re, you know, going through a whole rate cost of service study, they're actually putting it on the bill as a line item. And once that's paid for, that'll go off the bill and um, it's gone. And that, to me, that makes, makes pretty good sense. So, Looking at the future, um, battery technology, if they can get that to be efficient and effective, that will be a real game changer in the electric industry. Um, you can't store electricity like you can store natural gas or propane, but if you can get the battery technology to that point where you can store electricity, that changes the whole, the whole uh, issue of energy and how you're gonna use it and that type of thing. It's coming along, and I think you know uh, all of our engineers and technicians and scientists are working on it, but it, we're not quite there yet. Um, the other thing that's kind of my pet projects are nuclear energy. I believe in it quite strongly. Um, in the United States, there's been kind of a, since about the 1980s, we really haven't developed any big uh, nuclear reactors. They're, most recent were licensed in Georgia, two reactors, and um, they're, be, they're being under, they're under construction. I think it was a couple years ago, Finland uh, um, completed one of the largest reactors, I think it's a 1200 megawatt reactor. Um, that's the reactor, that's not the generating station. You wanna see some big nuclear power plants, China, they have reactors, um, groups of reactors that are putting out 7,500 megawatts at a time. Huge, massive plants that, um, I don't know if you've looked at them, but I mean, it, it is spectacular to see some of those things that they're doing. Um, one of the interesting things that is coming in the nuclear uh, technology is um, these underground nuclear plants. They're very small. They're 30 to 200 megawatts. And the reason that they're putting them underground is they can control in the reactor. If something happens, they can close it down real quickly and um, you know, end any, any possibility of having any big damage. And uh, I know I talked to Glenn. Glenn was my boss who was on, sat on the commission. And uh, Glenn and I have talked about this before, but um, one of the things I did, I thought, well, geez, I wonder how much nuclear um, uraniums would it take to run the city of Grand Rapids? So we looked at um, uh, uranium-232 for light water reactors, and it would take about a quarter of a cubic yard of uranium material to run the city of Grand Rapids for a year. So you're looking, you know, a little chunk of uranium. Um, it's pretty interesting how that, how that works. But anyway, again, that's kind of just my, my opinion on the nuclear side of it. But there are other things out there, you know, cold fusion, hydrogen, biofuels. 
that they're looking at from a generating standpoint. And um, I think to me, the biggest thing is, is that, you know, our engineers, our business people, our scientists, our technicians have to have the ability to try those things. You know, government cannot stand in the way with a lot of regulations, you know, they need to set up the parameters and then let these people, you know, do what they can do to try to figure out what's the best course for society. They've been pretty successful so far and, um, you know, I have a lot of faith in, in the scientific community and the engineering community um, that they'll come up with the answers that we need if we give them that opportunity to do that. That's it. All right, good morning. First off, how, how has my team done here uh, for you guys? Yeah? Lunch been okay? Some of you stay overnight, or are we all locals? Local. All of us are locals. So you guys didn't get to take in my, my nice beds and my car wash for, for showers and all that? Your pink suites are awesome. You, okay, you've oh, experienced it. showers are amazing. All right, okay. All right. I call it the car wash, double heads, double body. You know, just sit there and spin it. It, it gets everything clean and quick. So, 13 gallons a minute. Now, just in case any of you guys put one in, your 40 gallon hot water heater ain't going to last too long. So, yeah. So, I was, uh, don't get me wrong, I was somewhat confused a little bit uh, why I was asked uh, to come up here and talk to you guys. Uh, uh, I dug into it a little bit. They gave me some questions. Uh, you know, why would you want to talk to a hoteler about power? And uh, I could see maybe with my other, you know, part-time gig that uh, you might want to talk to me as a commissioner, but really would want to talk to me as a as an owner of a hotel. Um, you know, I got they they gave me three questions. I might answer one or two. I'm no PowerPoint, so I'm at the camera, no PowerPoint. I'm not a PowerPoint guy. I'm a straight talker, just so you guys are aware of it. I, uh, I ain't gonna BS with any of you. I'm gonna tell you some of the challenges that we've had as, as, a, uh, as a business. You know, one of the first things was, um, you know, what, what kind of charges do I find on my commercial bill? Well, uh, my commercial bill, and then Tony really, and he's an expert, don't get me wrong. Um, you know, on a commercial side of things, uh, it's the high demand charge that gives us, okay? So that 15 minutes of whatever, you know, just dictated my rate that month. So, which leads into this, my next, and that's, there's a real challenge. I mean, to be honest with you, controlling it, all right? Um, which leads into the next, you know, how do you handle controlling it? Um, so this was built 2007, opened in 2008. The economy took a, you know, a dive. Uh, in September, we opened in May. Um, you know, at that time, I had 92 employees. Uh, you know, as we were watching things go the first six, nine, ten months, it's like, all right, I can't, I can't keep 92 employees working. You know, um, reduced it to 82 employees, still wasn't enough. You know, I have to make decisions. What kind of service do you want? What kind of service do I want to give? Um, you know, I do want the best employees I can get you know, in this business to work for me, uh, pay them well, because um, the, the best cost money. Um, with that in mind though, how can I shave more money out of this deal? The banker don't care. I mean, the banker wants their money. Uh, so how do you shave? Well, we looked at our power bill. Uh, what was our demand? I mean, I can buy a cheaper cut of meat. I mean, you know, I can, I can buy all that kind of stuff. I can buy the cheapest soap there is or the cheapest towels there are. And I'm going to add to you, that's the number one thing that gets stolen from here. <laughs> is a pool towel that I pay $3 for. They're basically cardboard with a blue stripe on it. And last year, last year I lost $1,200. 
Yeah, so I don't know what people want them for, but whatever. Uh, they don't steal the $15 towel. But, uh, so, you know, um, so here's what we did. Uh, when we built this place, um, uh, well, how's this? This wall right here, this is, a, this is an ICF wall. 12 inch thick, a couple inches of, uh, of um, you know, foam on both sides, goes three floors, okay? Does it cost more money than a normal block? Yes, it does. Uh, the benefit, basically, is, is the, you know, the, the foam, how's that insulating factor? But with that in mind, um, it was quick to build too, but we knew that we were going to get some energy uh, savings and and quietness between the rooms. Every other wall in this place is an ICF wall; it goes three stories up. Um, but so here we are. We're looking at our, our power bill. <coughs> Somehow we got to shave some you know some money out of this this place every month. Um, went on a hiring freeze. Um, you know, watched our every penny that we could. Um, then we started looking at our power bill, and there was this spike was, you know, and, and uh, I was called public utilities, called up Tony, and, and I had a um, oh, uh, gentleman come in, set up all the computers onto my demand, onto my, onto my electrical. Panel and we sat there. We we ran their their program for a handful of days and and tried to figure out what time you know what time do you think my high demand is or was I should say was late afternoon. Huh? Late afternoon. no you know it was it was goofy I mean could be eight to nine o'clock at night you know could be eleven to twelve o'clock it was goofy. So we started going, I mean, I walked into a room and I can tell you exactly what that, you know, coffee maker drops, or your blow dryer, or your, you know, little refrigerator. I'm gonna tell you, don't go buy a little refrigerator, just go buy a big refrigerator, because they cost the same to run. I mean, right to a T, <laughs> okay? Um, but everything, what the light costs per room, you know, what that HVAC unit, you know, for the heating and cooling in that room, what's it cost? Um, pool. Yeah, I got some stuff there in that pool, you know, uh, uh, besides boilers, and but you got some motors in there, you know, um, you know, stuff here to make this, you know, warm or cold. And, uh, but that kitchen was my, was my challenge. And, um, we basically got it down to one oven. It was a double stack electric oven that was causing my spike. That's all I mean, we just we just kept going down, down, down. Like, bingo. There's my problem unplugged. And I brought in a gas unit. I mean I, I apologize, Tom, but that's what I did nine years ago. <laughs> uh, no more spike. You know, just chunk, it was gone. Um, but let me explain some things that we took, um, that we did before we ever opened the door. Um, well, hold on, I'm gonna backtrack. With, with us doing all of this, there were some things that we did that might surprise you. Um, our ice machines. Um, so on your floor as well. They run constantly, right? Um, not mine. mine. Mine turn off between 2 a.m. and 7, 8 p. or 8 a.m. Uh, there's enough ice there, but I don't need to make ice um, at that time. How was that? Um, the I can turn off certain things if needed real quick. I do have a generator backup. Um, 
just so you guys are aware, because you all know that we lose power here periodically. I have lost power um, here for, well, not days, but half a day, three quarters of a day. Um, and it's not so much Elevators got to work, the toilets got to work, um, you know, and possibly some lighting should work, aka maybe the hallway. I'm just, and my key making ability needs to work to run the doors. I mean, and we have found all this out, but, um, but because of that, we did some interesting things after we've done the study. And that ice machine was one of them. You'd be surprised what a commercial ice machine spins. But um, when we built, before we opened, I'll do, I'll do this to you. Um, my pool, you know, to run a slide, uh, you know, that was running at um, 900 gallons a minute to run that. Uh, we reduced it down to 600 gallons a minute in water, and then we took control of the the you know 10 horse motor, uh, did a variable speed style motor to it, so it isn't otherwise it's a switch, you know what I mean? A chunk. Um, that um, we try to do all variable speed motors if possible. Of that. I mean, I don't care what we're trying to run, we're trying to do with all variable speed motors. Try to control your, your on and your off. Um, especially your on, I should say. So my place here is controlled, all the lighting really is controlled by computers. Um, so right now, you know, these lights are only on at 90%. Because the human eye can't tell the difference between 90% and 100%. So, I mean, 10% right off the top. All my outside lighting is controlled by computer. I know right away when it gets too dark, it kicks itself on. I do have a photo eye backup, don't get me wrong. But otherwise, we're done off just a sundial and so on and so forth. Uh, but if, let's say we had a really bad thunderstorm, all of a sudden my parking lights would come on. And it would kick over right onto the electric guy and says, hey, it's dark out for some reason. Pop, it comes on. Um, Everything's LED out there. I replacing I am replacing most things with LED here. All my rooms at the Super 8 are LED. Um, I'm slowly, I should slowly, I'm, I'm getting quicker at it here. Everything to change over to LED too. Um, but you know, like let's say my hallway uh, lights, you know, which are on usually 24/7 in a hotel. No. Mine at one o'clock, every other. Um, most people are in bed sleeping at 1 a.m. You know what? Six o'clock in the morning, they kick back on. Um, so why not Why not have six hours or five hours worth of savings? I mean, uh, even though you're, you're running good, good bulbs and a little bit, it's still, why, why not turn off half? You know? Um, Talk about one more thing. Uh, you know, my my hot water heaters. Um, yes, they are gas. They are high efficient, high efficiency gas. Um, what gets me is um, my little water heater for my pool. You would think that you know you have a big water heater. It's not, it's a very small water heater. Uh, this is like a dishwasher, commercial dishwasher water heater. Uh, only two gallons, three gallons, but you know, it's cute. And it's got like nine different heating elements in there. So when it turns on, it spins the meter, you know. When you're doing dishes, I don't care, I need to do dishes. Pool, same way, I mean, a pool's got to stay warm. Um, how we how we fixed it a little bit, cheated a little bit, um, is this that we have a Willsbow system in the pool, and that Willsbow system runs on the floor. 
Well, so that takes away from my need of heating things or cooling things. This is a lot more efficient that way. Um, it takes away the dampness, it takes away the slipping hazard, but uh, it keeps my it keeps my pool at a more even keel where my recovery rate I can get quicker if I need to. Um, uh, it just um, in a pool, just so you people understand this, um, hot tubs are run at 102 degrees. A big, a big pool is run at 84. Um, you know, uh, the temperature inside that room is at 86. It's always a three, three degrees negative on, on air. So you guys are aware of pools. In case you want to be in a pool business, don't do it. It's a sucking <laughs> sound. Um, they go on to the next question you had. You had a little bit about my, uh, I laughed. I, this first question, what do I think about my, you know, my power bill? Well, my biggest challenge is you don't pay it. But, um, let me, let me throw some other ideas at you. Um, <coughs> community, it says individual, uh, what are some of the individual community actions that could be taken to improve impacts on energy consumers? Now I'm going to put on my, my uh, commissioner hat. Um, you know, economic development is high, I admit you have the mayor here. Um, and have a city council member here and all that. Um, economic development to us is is huge. I mean, we're not you know, it's in a game. I mean, it's, we we have got to make this happen. You know, big blue box just just put 180 people out of business. You know, big blue box ain't gonna last forever. And I'm not care if we're talking about the big blue box down the road too. I mean, uh, that makes power. They're going to reduce down a little bit. Um, somehow we need to get more good paying jobs in our area. And I don't care if it's a job that only employs three, or if it's a job that employs all of you, or it's a job that employs, you know, a hundred times what I look at here. I don't really care. I need to have a lot of them. Um, you know, the big fish, have you ever, but it's funny, have you ever caught a 32 inch walleye? No, I like the little ones. <laughs> yeah, I have never caught a 32 inch walleye neither. I've been fishing all my life, yeah. you know. Um, but I've caught a bunch of crappies, you know, some 15 inch walleye, 17 inch walleyes, they eat real well, you know. So um, the challenge for us uh, in city, county, I don't care if we're talking about whatever city, is to um, be ready for these people and businesses when they come. Now, Spud knows and, and, and Rick knows that um, when I say shovel ready, I mean shovel ready. Um, you know, I got water sitting at the doorstep, I got power sitting at the doorstep, you know, I got sewer sitting at the doorstep. And you better be able to tell me what kind of dirt I got to take in or take out to make this happen. You know, the, the do's and the don'ts of building, um, it should be really spelled out quick and fast. One of the challenges we have here, and this is, this is where we're telling you this, is um, the perception that we are a small, small town, USA, uh, no different, you know, than gentlemen over here, you know, these people in the Twin Cities, you know, dictating. But these corporations, I'll tell you very much, they just look at this population sign and they, and they say, uh, um, you know, you're 10,000 people. Well, we're not. We're not. We're, you know, we're 30,000 people within 15 miles of town. You're wrong. And in the boot, uh, if you add in the summertime, we're about 60,000 people in that same radius. We have to show them that, and that's part of the challenges I'm not sure we've done so far. So, um, I, have, I have a little bit, uh, uh, I heard what 
Don said, and, and I, I, I was very much pleased when he was going first. I don't know why you brought my name up or why you brought my name up, but you guys brought my name up, so I'll throw one at you that I've sat through a couple of these uh, before, and I've, I, I've heard about the wind and the solar and the hydro, and, and, and uh, I do. I am a park owner of a mobile home community in St. Cloud. You know, um, 250 houses, 600 people live there. And the city of Sartell put a solar garden in next to my community. You know, mobile home communities used to be like a little redhead step shop. You know what I mean? Oh, you guys gotta go outside of town, you know? Oh, well, now guess what? Town has caught up with us, you know? Um, but in Sartell, so all of a sudden I got a 40 acre solar garden. <coughs> Tell me, what do you think my property's worth? Next door to a 40 acre solar garden. Value, value wise. Went down a little bit. It's not that it's hurting my, my people living there. It's not. I mean, community is just as beautiful as it always was. Great people. But you know, think about where to put these, I guess, in the future is very, you know, it's like a um, forward thinking. How was that? Forward think that. I'm a little different in tone when it comes to uh, uh, nuclear. I do like nuclear, but I'm going to throw one at you as hydro. Canada does almost 99% hydro. Canada does some things that we probably in northern Minnesota should learn, but I just throw that at you think about hydro. Um, so, any questions of me? I'm going to stop there. I've ran it. I got the five minute warning. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, so with that, we're going to bring uh, okay. Tony back up and then uh, give Come you on, a, Tony. a second to, to so write So get the expert questions. here and ask him all questions. I know he has answers better than me. So. I have a question for you. Okay. So after all this, um, having uh, the utilities come in and find out where all your excess power usage was coming from and your spiking, and, so how, after you went through all that, how much did you end up saving percentage-wise on your bill? Uh, I don't know. I can tell you probably about 15 grand a year. Not, I mean, I paid for my my oven immediately right. when I put it in. You know, that's a twelve thousand dollar oven. So, yeah. Well, did you get to trade your electric one in? No, I sold it to the truth, not for much money, but <laughs> yeah, I sold it. To, I'll be honest with you, I sold it. So I, I didn't get very much money, but I sold it. Go ahead. Uh, and this might be more for Tony or possibly the person on my right, but uh, just a rough idea of uh, the different kind of how much power is used by the different sectors. So, Residential business. Now that's a Julie question. If you could yeah. write. And, and I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'd be happy with the closer ten percent or whatever. And, and if you don't know, that's understandable. Well, I'm a little bit off my head. Where um, I just find it pretty good. I'm just sort of guessing that right. businesses in town might oh. include the hospital. Well, so what did you see yesterday? At Thirty industrial, um, and then twenty twenty-five and. Can I can I throw one at you? <clears throat> Eliminate some of them once and see what your bill goes up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm being a bit, when Mag goes down. What do you think is going to happen? Oh, oh, yeah. You know, uh, if, if, I I had a I, I got to. Uh, do a a uh, a walkabout over at this pump station over in Deer River. It's an Embridge. It's an Embridge pump station. You you know what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Take a guess how much their bill is every month on electric. I'll give you a hint. It's a six-digit number. And whatever you think, it just came to your mind probably times it by five. So, which would mean half. 
that makes any good sense to you. Not a seven, but half of a seven. So, and just think, Floodwood, Grand Rapids, Cass Lake, clearly. I mean, how many of these substations do they have that move this stuff along? At half a million dollars every month. Now take them out of the loop once and see what your guys' power is going to go up. You know? Take the big blue box out. Just, just the big blue box out. I mean, it will affect. I don't know how it, would be. it wouldn't. But maybe there's something magical. Maybe he knows or she knows something better than I do. But that's just common sense coming out of me. The only yeah. question I was going to ask you before was illustrate for the group and just how much a difference it is from uh, electricity pricing from the ordinary base rates. What happens when you get a peak? Hmm. What does that do to your bill? Just quantify it, ballpark it for us, if you would. Are we talking double price at peak? Now? Well, yeah, when you're looking at just energy prices, like from a wholesale power standpoint, maybe I don't know if this will answer your question or not, but you're probably looking at in Minnesota Power's case, probably a cent and a half to two cents for the energy per kilowatt hour. And then the demand side, which is the capacity, you know, all of their assets that you're paying for, that's like $19.18 per kilowatt. So that's those are the two differentials that you're kind of paying on your electric bill. I think as the example that we often show, just a step put it in perspective, if we can do load management, as we've been talking about, and shave those peaks, it's about $19,000 a month if we can drop it one megawatt. Yeah. So you can bring that peak down one megawatt, that's $19,000. It makes, it makes a big difference. And it all goes back to the efficiency of these generators. You know, as you have to, as you bring on more wind and solar, you know, one of the questions that the engineers are always concerned about is, um, you know, you, you have all the solar energy going, it's fine, and then, you know, all of a sudden it drops off, and then somebody else has to pick that, pick that load up. So you're starting to ramp up and ramp down all these generating systems, and it becomes really inefficient to do that. <coughs> and that's going to add to your costs on the other side of it. You got to you have to keep the electrical system in balance. You can do it through regulation and through capacitors, but you can only do it within a certain margin. And then you have to start ramping these generators up and down. And that's why gas is becoming kind of a popular generating source. You know, you have a base load, which is usually coal or the big plants or something. They don't come up and down very fast. They're there and try to run a steady state. Gas can kind of take that and level that off pretty quickly and bring those up and down pretty quick. Yeah. Tony, uh, you've heard a lot about load management and the effects that this can have on shaving those peaks. You also talked about the 1.5% that the PUC has to pay on conservation improvements. Correct. Is individual load management plans, is that covered under that or is there a way that that can be covered so you could get that one to two megawatts out there, whether it's business or individuals, if they're customers willing to let their, their yes. energy usage at their home go down? Can that be yes. covered under the in, in the rules that um, pertain to that, um, you can spend, and I don't remember the exact amount, you can send, spend a certain portion of that 1.5% on uh, demand site management programs. So there is an offset to that. We can use some of that money to um, develop the load management system and then take credit for the kilowatt hours that were that were reducing. But, you know, if you think about that, over time, and it would take a number of years, but over time, you're going to run out of trying to reduce this thing one and a half percent eventually. You know, from a theory standpoint, there's not going to be anything to reduce it. Anymore. So, it's time for maybe one more question. If anybody has something? But one, one other question on the one and a half percent. One of the issues that we ran into and um, you have to kind of keep an eye on it is there's no measurement of what you spend to reduce that kilowatt hour of electricity. That kilowatt hour is pretty cheap, six and a half cents or whatever on a wholesale basis. Some of the programs that we had to reduce kilowatt hours were costing almost $10 a kilowatt hour for that reduction 
it's kind of a flaw in that program that they're not measuring, you know, who's more efficient at reducing those kilowatt hours. 